The title of the sermon this morning, the title of this morning's message is, The Gospel is More Powerful Than You Think It Is. The Gospel is More Powerful Than You Think It Is. You died to sin and are set free in, from sin in Christ. The Gospel is more powerful than you think it is. You died to sin and are set free from sin in Christ. So I understand a couple of things as I walk into preaching not only this message, but all of Romans chapter 6. And so I want you to hear a couple things uh, so you know them now. One is, chapter 6 doesn't answer everything about all theology. Should be obvious to you, chapter 6 isn't all-encompassing. You'll still have questions at the end of chapter 6 if all you hear is chapter 6. But I also know that just hearing the title of the message, the gospel is more powerful than you think it is, you died to sin and are set free from sin in Christ, probably has some of your wheels spinning. Thinking, wait, is that what the Bible says? Or maybe asking, how does James know how powerful I think the gospel is? How can he say it's more powerful than I think it is? Well, first let me say, no matter how powerful you think the gospel it is, it's more powerful than you think it is. And I'm realizing more and more, especially when it comes to sin, that most Christians do not think the gospel is nearly as powerful as the Bible says it is. I found that simply saying, you died to sin and are set free from sin in Christ. Simply making that statement in Christian circles gets a wide range of responses. Anywhere from that's legalism to, wait, but that can't mean. I want you to think for a moment. Who would want us to believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ, including the Holy Spirit of God in us, has no real power over sin? Who would want us to read Romans chapter 6 and ask, did God really say? So now I, I, I need to say this at the outset, so you've also heard this. I know that the absolute sinless perfection is not what Paul is talking about here. We'll continue to preach through Romans 7, Romans 8. We need a robust doctrine of the gospel and its power over sin. And yet, our text today and all of Romans 6 over the weeks ahead, Paul gives us truth. Paul gives us promises. God tells us something about who we are in Christ. And these promises are sin-crushing, life-giving, sanctification-empowering, and freedom-producing. I want you to know that when Paul says he's eager to preach the gospel in chapter 1, When he says he's eager to preach the gospel in chapter 1, he he says it's God's power for salvation. God's power for salvation. Wait till you see the power in chapter 6. Because if you have God's power for salvation in you and available to you, how would and should that affect your relationship with sin? Because sin is the very thing you need God's power to be saved from. We will hear things over the weeks ahead about living by faith in the newness of life. Living by faith in the newness of life. And how that relates to the sin in our lives. We are going to hear things like this. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
How can we who died to sin still live in it? And I'm concerned that the modern church has come up, can't come up with all sorts of answers to that question. It's a rhetorical question. We'll also hear, just as, just listen for a minute, just as Christ was raised from the dead, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life. Or, our old self was crucified with Jesus. Why? In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. He goes on after verse 7. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. For sin will have no dominion over you. All that in chapter 6 leading up to this. But thanks be to God that you who were once and no longer once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been what? Set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. And if chapter 6 is true, which it is. By the way, all I just did was read verses from chapter 6. If all of these things in chapter 6 are true, then the modern church has drifted far leftward in regards to the power of the gospel. The power of the new covenant. The power of Jesus. Christ in you. The modern church is not fully comprehending what it means that we have been given new hearts by God and God's Holy Spirit in us or why that has happened. First Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Let me ask you again, church. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's Spirit dwells in you? The gospel is more powerful than we think it is. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. He goes on, 11 through 13. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead... If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Notice he says, in your mortal bodies. This is not post-glorification. This is not theoretical. In your mortal bodies. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The gospel is more powerful than we think it is. And that's where we're headed. And we get to chapter 8. But first, let's remember what he says in chapter 6. What is this in response to? What is this in response to? One thing I'm going to deal with later, especially in chapter, chapter 7, is what Paul's doing a lot of times here, and we'll see it today, he's writing in what is called a diatribe. He's writing, and then he's having a conversation with a theoretical person or himself, even asking himself questions. And so he's writing as though it's a back and forth sometimes. And so when he says chapter 5, when he starts chapter 6, he's almost ha responding to chapter 5, knowing there'll be questions after chapter 5, and then giving the answer to the response. He does that multiple times in 
in this letter. Last week we looked at the second half of chapter 5. We saw that we, we are reigning. We are reigning in grace. How? Through righteousness. That leads to eternal life in Jesus. We saw that sin entered through Adam. It's deeper than just our own sin. Sin entered through Adam. And spread to all. And therefore all deserve eternal separation from God. But those who are in Christ, those who have repented of their sin and live by faith, are now under grace. Sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to death. But grace is not like sin and death. Through grace we receive the gift of righteousness. It's called a gift. The gift of righteousness, which leads to what? Not sin and death. Life. Grace leads to life. Life through the abundant and free gift of righteousness. The abundant and free gift of righteousness through Jesus. That's power. We received the free gift, we didn't earn it, the free gift of righteousness in Christ Jesus. Then in 17 he said this, For if because of one man Adam's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more, much more, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness do what? Reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Amen? I want you to think of the power of being forgiven of all of your sin. All of it. Past, present, future, all forgiven. Think of the power of being forgiven of all of your sin. Think of the power of receiving Christ's righteousness to reign in your body, in life. I want you to begin to ask yourself this question that I'm going to ask you multiple times today or even tell us multiple times today. I want you to begin asking yourself this question over the next weeks, months, years. Ask yourself. Even when you're thinking about something theological or having a conversation with someone, ask yourself, what if the gospel is more powerful than I think it is? Just simply ask yourself that question sometimes. What if the gospel is more powerful than I think it is? And I'll say it again. However powerful you think the gospel is, it is more powerful than that. Paul ended last week telling us, verse 21, so that as sin once, sin reigned in death, past sin reigned in death, Grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace reigns. Grace now reigns in us through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the Christian life. Grace reigning in us through righteousness, leading to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Paul transitions to chapter 6. Paul transitions and begins to answer the question what does this grace look like in the life of a born again follower of Jesus Christ? What does this grace look like? What does it look like to live by faith? What does it look like when we are baptized into Christ? What does it look like when we are filled with the Spirit of God? Those are the questions he's going to be answering for us, especially over the next few chapters. What should the Christian life look like if these things are true of us? What should the Christian life look like if it is lived by faith? A faith that knows that grace will reign through us through righteousness leading to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord, open to our text for today. Romans 6, 1 through 7. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Why? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin, God's holy word to us, his church, on this Lord's day. I want to tell you one more thing before we start. Please hear me say this. Please hear me say this. There are no commands in this entire text. There's not a single command in this text. These are truths about us, not commands to us. These are truths about us, not commands to us. Actually, there hasn't been a single command in the book of Romans yet. And even the first command in the book of Romans, which we'll probably see next week, is a command to believe something. So if you hear this text and hear an ounce of legalism, he's not telling us to do anything. He's telling us something about who we are in Christ Jesus. He's telling us where the power comes from, and it's not us. These are gospel truths about those who have been saved by grace and what that grace does to those who have been saved by it. These are gospel truths about those who have been saved by God's grace and what that grace does to those who have been saved by it. The gospel is more powerful than you think it is. So Paul starts with a question. This is a question to anticipate false gospel. This is a question to anticipate a false gospel that may come when someone sees how awesome grace is and thinks, how can I take advantage of that to stay in my sin? Paul asks this question to show us there's a fork in the road. There are two ways one could understand how grace works in our lives. And they could not be more different. We could see the power of grace as a free pass for sinners to go to heaven and stay in their sin because then grace will be more. And Paul crushes that false way. And then he leads us down the way of true faith, showing us the gospel is way more powerful than we think it is. Helping us to see that the power of the grace, the power of grace that forgives us of all of our sin. Amen? The power of grace, the same grace that forgives us of all of our sin, gives us resurrection power to live sanctified lives in righteousness by the Holy Spirit of God within us. All grace. The gospel is way more powerful than we think it is. First, the question, truth number one. God does not need us to sin to show the power of his grace. God does not need us to sin to show the power of his grace. And what we'll see throughout chapter 6 is the power of his grace is seen in us when he transforms us. 
No, it leaves us there. Verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. He's going to spend a lot of time explaining what that means and what that looks like and how that's even possible. But first he just puts an end to that road. Don't, don't even go down that road. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. So before we get to the power, before we see how powerful the gospel of grace is to put sin to death by the Spirit in the life of those who have been born again and filled with the Spirit, the first thing we must see is this simple Q&A. A simple question that crushes every ounce of false gospel. This might even be a good catechism question. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. This simple question crushes every ounce of a false gospel that excuses sin. This simple question and answer crushes every ounce of a false gospel that would lead people to think they can stay in sin and even become prideful to those who would call them out of sin. What shall we say then? Why does Paul ask it this way? What shall we say then? Because he knows this is a way that the devil is going to twist grace. Twist the word. Ask the question, did God really say? Is grace really powerful in your actual life? Is God's Holy Spirit really within you? Paul's pushing against an objection. This is what false teachers are going to say in one way or another. So the word of God here to us, the spirit of God here speaking to us, graciously helps us not to fall into any demonic false teaching, any demonic false teaching on sin that would make someone who claims to have the spirit of Christ to be okay with, even prideful about, or deceived in the thinking that the gospel of grace saves us from sin by giving us a free pass to stay in it. That the gospel of grace has no actual power over the sin in our lives. The preacher Jonathan Edward once said, a holy life is the chief sign of grace. A holy life is the chief sign of grace. And so we come to the end of chapter 5, and we could say one of two things. We could say, first, grace reigns in the life of Christians. Grace reigns in the life of Christians. So that when we sin, we would say, isn't it so good Jesus died for our sins so we can continue to live in it? Or, the alternative, we could say, isn't it so powerful and good that Jesus died for all of our sin so we could die to sin and no longer live in it? And so which is it? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer to this question is simple and yet profound by no means. The wonderful truths of chapter 5 have been twisted into a false gospel that would say grace covers our sin, amen, so stay in it. No, by no means. And you see signs of that false gospel when sin is not talked about. Or there's not a seriousness about sin. Or there's no preaching of repentance unto salvation. Or sin is no longer seen as a big deal or is even excused. And this is where we need to remember the Bible is not a self-help book. This chapter is not telling us what to go do. It's telling us who we now are. It's telling us the power we now have. 
so go live in it. First, you've got to believe it. Which is why the first command coming is, believe it. These two doctrines, the doctrine of sin and the teaching of repentance, these two doctrines, the doctrine of sin and the teaching of repentance have been so watered down in the modern church, it's hard to hear them. Why? Because when sin is not seen as serious, or where there is no gospel power in our lives to overcome sin, by the Spirit and the Word, then repent, repentance isn't even preached. And then people are led to believe we can continue in sin that grace may abound. We're led to believe that there are those who focus on grace and those who focus on sin. And Paul's saying here, no. God's grace is so powerful that it radically changes our relationship with sin. It's grace that does that. These are not separate doctrines. Grace includes the free gift of justification. Grace also includes the free gift of the Holy Spirit to put our sin to death. And in our actual lives, in our mortal bodies. And so, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. God's grace to cover all our sins is so amazing. God's grace to cover all of our sins is so amazing. There is no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Zero, none, covered, paid for, justified, finished. God's grace to cover all of our sins is so amazing that we must preach to those who are truly born again, to those who are truly saved. If you are a Christian this morning, if you are living by faith in Jesus, hear me say, God's grace to you has covered all of your sin. All of it. The blood of Jesus gives you forgiveness for not only your past, but all of your sin. And by that grace, by His grace, you have gospel power now. Today. In this life. In order for you to be saved from your sin, however tall the pile of your sin is, and it's taller than you think it is, Grace must be more. And it is. However many sins you have, grace must cover all of them. And grace is that amazing. And it is not just amazing in a get out out of hell free sort of way. No, the power of grace is in a resurrection sort of way. Old self dead. Old self hung on a cross. Dead. New self, living and reigning in righteousness and life. We'll see what that looks like more and more as we go through chapter 6. But for now, in these verses, the simple and yet profound truth, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound by no means? By no means there means... That is not a thing. Or no way, or absolutely not. Why? Because to continue in sin and is to not know the power of the one true gospel that causes us to die to our sin and be set free from it. Truth number two. If you died to sin, you cannot live in sin or you have not died to sin. Verse 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. And then he says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And he's not asking that question to help us look for a loophole. 
It's rhetorical. First, let's ask, what does it mean to live in sin? What's he talking about here, to live in sin? Well, he he uses it interchangeably with to continue in sin or to be continuing in sin. Got another question for you. Who is it that would invent a doctrine that would say you can just go ahead and continue in your sin and that will make grace look better? Who would invent a doctrine that would say you can just go ahead and continue in your sin because that will make grace look better? The devil, that's who. When it comes to this false teaching, I want you to see that that lie started in the garden. And now here we are with Paul, soon after Jesus ascended into heaven, it didn't take long for this false teaching to come back and arise again. Did God really say? Is God really that powerful? This is right after the ascension of Christ. Historically. And this has already crept in. If that is true, how much more should we be on the lookout for this false gospel that has infiltrated the majority of the church and many of its 55,000 denominations? A weak gospel that has very little power in our, our actual lives. And a gospel with no power is no gospel at all. What we're about to see in Romans 6 is so powerful that it's going to cause us, the church, to say one of two things. Either we're going to hear Romans 6 and and say, that doesn't sound like the way I think of Christianity. Or, what I hope it causes us to say is this, wow, the gospel is way more powerful than I thought it was. And if that's where we're at, we should ask God, God, by your Holy Spirit, and to give glory to your name, make me understand and live in this gospel power. I hope that's our response. Why? Because how can we who, live, who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul says this in Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How good is that? And, How dramatically is the life of a Christian who's been killed, crucified even, put to death with Christ, and now lives, but only lives, I live with Christ in me. Notice it doesn't simply say Christ with me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So now I live by faith in Jesus who gave himself for me, who loves me. Or, how can we who died to sin still live in it? So he or she who continues living a life, living in sin, continuing in sin, how can they say, I have died to sin and Christ now lives in me? John says it this way in 1 John. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
Calvin said this of this verse. The state of the case is really this. The state of the case is really this. That the faithful are never reconciled to God without the gift of regeneration. The faithful are never reconciled to God unless they are regenerated, made new. Died, old self, born again. No, we are to this end justified that afterwards we may serve God in the holiness of life. Christ indeed does not cleanse us. Christ indeed does not cleanse us by his blood, nor render God's propitiation to us in any other way other than by making us partakers of his spirit, which renews us to a holy life. He goes on. It would then be the most strange inversion of the work of God were sin to gather strength on the account of grace. The grace which is offered to us in Christ, and then he ends with this, for medicine is not a feeder of the disease which it destroys. Or, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Gospel does not mean that God now expects us to live holy lives to earn our salvation. This is not a command. This is not Paul saying, come on now, try harder. No, the gospel means that God's grace makes us righteous before a holy God because of the righteousness of Christ for us. Puts the Holy Spirit of God in us, making all these truths true of us. That by his power we would live like it. This is God reminding us. Those of us who Christ died for. That he died for our sin. This is God's word showing us that the gospel is more powerful. Practically powerful. Actually powerful. Not just theoretically powerful. The gospel is more powerful than we think it is. Truth number three. Christ died for your sins so that when you were baptized into him, you died to sin. You died to the sin he died for. Christ died for your sins so that when you were baptized into him, you died to the sin he died for. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul now begins to show the reality of who we now are in Christ in regards to sin. To show this power is realized in our lives. It's real. And he shows us this through the death of Christ. And our death with him as shown, seen, empowered through our baptism. Our baptism into Christ. Notice this verse. This truth is also in the form of a question. That's important to see, especially in chapter 7. Paul writes this letter as though he's having a conversation with someone. And he starts this verse with, Do you not know? Do you not know? In other words, do you not see how powerful baptism into Christ's death is? Are you limiting the power of the gospel truth that we see and experience in baptism? And what truth is it that we see? That all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. There's an old self. And if you've been baptized into Christ, that old self should be gone, dead, with Christ. So a couple things here. This is a call to baptism. If you're in Christ, if you've been born again, if, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and have not been baptized, that should happen. And maybe after preaching this, we should start plan a time to do that soon. But this is also telling us something about the gospel. Our old self had a problem, a huge problem. We were created by God, a holy God, 
We were created to be image bearers, to live for His glory. And because of the sin of Adam spread to us, because of our sin, we did not do that. And that's a big problem. A problem we cannot overcome. And yet, when Christ died, if He died for your sin, when Christ died, it's as though you died with Him. Your baptism is saying, I died with Jesus when He died on the cross. The self that was full of sin and needed salvation died on the cross with Jesus. Saving faith in Jesus is to be followed by baptism. And baptism here in this text means baptism in every sense of the word baptism, if you're wondering. Baptism here into Christ. And our baptism into Christ is related to the death of Christ because just like Christ died for our sins, when we are baptized into Him, we die with Him. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, in some way you can say you are dead. Because your old self died. Your old self was put to death. We'll see in a minute, even crucified. When Jesus died for us, He died for our sin. And when we died with Him in baptism, we die. Which includes dying to the sin that He died for. You didn't die for your sin. He died for your sin. We die to the sin that He died for Meaning, the gospel is more powerful than we think it is, leading to truth number four. Our death through baptism unites us to Christ, who was raised from the dead, so we would walk in new lives. Our death, our death through baptism also unites us to Christ, who was raised from the dead, so we would walk in new lives. Verse four, we were buried therefore with him, We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death. Why? In order that, just just as. At this point, if Paul's telling you this, you're like, just as, Paul, in the same way. Do you really mean that? We were were buried, therefore, with Jesus, with Him, by baptism into death. Why? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Just that sentence, just that statement makes me say to you, the gospel is more powerful than you think it is. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we, too, might walk in newness of life. As we say when we baptize believers, going under the water unites us to his death, and coming out of the water unites us to his resurrection. Do you know how powerful it is to say that? That's why Paul says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And then follows that with, how can we who were raised from the dead with Jesus not walk in a new life? Before repenting of your sin and putting your faith in Jesus, if you've done that, which I hope and pray that you have, before repenting of sin and putting your faith in Jesus, you had not died. You had not died with Him. You had not been raised with Him. You had not His Spirit in you. But now you have died with Christ. You have been raised with Christ. And by the Spirit of Christ, you are to walk in a new life. And I ask, if that's true, how new should that life be? Resurrection power new. Totally new. And in regards to what? What's Paul talking about here? A new life in regards to what subject? A new life in regards to sin. We died to sin when we died with Christ. We now live resurrection power lives and walk in this new life as those who have been raised from the dead with Jesus. 
And specifically here, by not continuing in the sin he died for, because you've been raised to a new life with Jesus. John even gives us as a test, as a way we can know if we have eternal life in 1 John, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And how did Jesus walk? The gospel is more powerful than we think it is. And that's seen in our baptism. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, just as that, we too might walk in the newness of life. Truth number five. If the death of Christ is for you, then the life of Christ is yours. So we have an if-then statement here. Four, verse five, if... We've been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The gospel is more powerful than you think it is. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Imagine with me for a moment... Imagine with me for a moment being united, one, united with the resurrected Jesus. Just imagine for a moment being united with the resurrected Jesus. And then let me tell you, you do not have to imagine that. That is who we are. It's true of us. If We've been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We are, we will be. And it's with that truth of our salvation in mind that Paul reminds us. It's that truth, the resurrection power of being united to Jesus, that Paul uses to show us how we should live our lives in regards to sin because of who we are. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. He's saying the death of Christ was certainly followed by the resurrection of Christ. Amen? You believe that? The death of Christ was certainly, no doubt, 100%, certainly followed by the resurrection of Christ. Jesus is alive. And so, if that is true, which it is, then our death with Christ, if that has happened to you, is certainly followed by resurrection with him and new life. Just as certain as Christ was raised from the dead. If the death of Christ is effectual in our lives, so then must the resurrection of Christ be effectual in our lives. And remember, this is not a command. It's a truth. It's a promise. Rely on it. It's true. When you look at the death of Christ, when we take communion, when we think of his death, when you look at the cross, think of all the power and the benefits that it has for you now and forever. And when you look upon the resurrected Christ, think of all the power and benefit that has to you now and forever. Because we love every word of the Word of God, I cannot ignore the fact that there's an if here. Meaning, if the death of Christ is yours by your union of Christ, then the resurrection power of Christ is also now yours by the same union with Christ. They go together. They're connected. They're inseparable. Do you believe that, church? What shall we say then? 
Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? For we've been united with, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The gospel is more powerful than you think it is. What kind of power do we have to overcome the power of sin by the Holy Spirit in us? Resurrection power. How powerful is resurrection power? I'm having a hard time standing here right now. How powerful is resurrection power? Truth number six. The reason we are put to death with Christ is so sin would have no power to enslave us anymore. That's how powerful resurrection power is. The reason we're put to death with Christ is so sin would have no power to enslave us anymore. Verse six. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Very key words here. In order that and so that. These are the outcomes. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Think of that when you look upon the cross. Our old self was crucified with him. Why? In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Paul's not nuanced here. This isn't gray. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Do you believe that? For reals, do you believe that? I'm just going to read it again. Word of God to us. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Why? In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Do you believe that? Our old self was in Adam. Our old self was under the power and penalty of sin. Our old self, if you are in Christ, that self, dead. So dead we can say crucified. Our old self is crucified. Paul uses the word crucified. Do you know what that means? It means you can stop carrying a dead body around with you. It's weird. Don't do it. Your old self died on the cross with Jesus. It's not your identity anymore. It's not who you are. We were all born into sin under Adam. And if you have repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ, that self is dead. Gone. Died on the cross with Jesus. Crucified. The gospel is more powerful than we think it is. The cross is more powerful than we think it is. May we believe in the power of the gospel and all of it. Not just the past power of the gospel, the present power of the gospel, the future power of the gospel. Why does it say our old self was crucified with Jesus on the cross? Why is that? In order that, in order to make the next thing happen, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. What? Nothing? Let me tell you something true of you if you are in Christ. Sin's rule in your life was broken on the cross. Or better said, Christ died for you who had no power to overcome the power of sin You died with him on that cross when he died for you on the cross. 
And when that truth is a reality in our lives, the powerful effect it has upon the body of sin is that it brings the body of sin to nothing. The Greek word there means made powerless, abolished, put an end to, ceases to exist. Why? What does that mean for us? The end of verse 6, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. To be enslaved to sin as a believer is as though there's a jail over there, and we've been set free from it, and we decide, I'm just going to go live in it, even though the door's unlocked. so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Do you believe that? No longer slaves to sin. That's what it says of us. No longer slaves to sin. As long as we live in this fallen world, we will be tempted to sin. True? Yes? We will battle with the flesh. We will even fall. But how much actual power does sin have to reign in us and make us its slave? None. Zero. Brought to nothing. It's powerless. Stop giving it power. Jesus on the cross for you means that the power of sin has been disarmed. And you have been set free from the chains of sin that you were once in. There was an old you. That old you was a slave to sin. The death power of the sin of Adam spread to you when you sinned. And if you have repented of your sin, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, let me ask you, where is that old you? Did you bring him here with you today? Because what the Word of God says is that old you is dead and hung on the cross with Jesus. Crucified. You have a new identity. Your old self is dead if you are in Christ. If you've been born again, it's because your old self died or you wouldn't have needed to be born again. No more shame. No more condemnation. Complete and full forgiveness. And more. What is Paul pointing us to here as more? Your old self was crucified on the cross with Jesus so that the power of sin in your life would be brought to nothing so that you would not be a slave to sin. Don't water down the power of the cross. Don't strip the gospel of its power. The gospel is more powerful than you think it is. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. What does this mean for us now? Truth number seven. Our death with Christ sets us free from sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. He's not talking about when you die and get put in the ground in a casket. He's talking about dying with Christ through baptism. He's talking about our old self being put to death so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. And if that's happened to you, he says here, you're not, why, why am I not a slave to sin? Why does sin have no power? Is the question he's answering. For, because one who has died has been set free from sin. Meaning, we were once chained to sin. We were once chained to eternal death. And we've now been set free to righteousness in life. For, because we who live by faith in Jesus have died with Him. If you've died with Christ, you've been set free from sin. There's much more to come on this. There's a lot to ponder here. But most of what I think we're trying to ponder here is what goes through our mind when I simply read these verses. 
There's a lot more to come on this in the chapters ahead, especially in the rest of this chapter. Be here. Listen to the sermons. But for now, I want you to hear and ask yourself, do you believe this power? For one who has died has been set free from sin. Do you believe that? For one who has died has been set free from sin. If you've died with Christ, you've been justified. Set free from the chains that sin put you in. The penalty of sin is no longer yours to pay. None of it. You are free. Jesus paid it all. Sin reigned in your life. You were in chains, but you have now died with Christ. So grace must now reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Death to sin is freedom. Death with Christ is freedom. The cross is freedom. Death to self is freedom. When Jesus died on the cross, our old self was crucified on the cross. If you've put your faith in Jesus, he died for you on that cross. And you can now say, with Paul, you've been crucified with him. When Jesus died for you on that cross, he died for your sin on that cross, you can now say you've been crucified with him. And since that self is now dead, you've been set free from sin. Not only the penalty of sin, and yes, there's much more to say on that, and much more on this, but for today, I just simply want you to see that the gospel is way more powerful than you think it is. You died to sin, and you are now free from sin. In the resurrected Jesus Christ. Sin has been disarmed. The chains are gone. You've been set free. The devil has no real actual power over you. Don't give him any. Stop giving him power. Sin's power over you has been brought to nothing. Stop handing it power. Stop believing the lies. Yes, we are in a battle with sin. A battle in which we have victory. Paul will tell us in chapter 8, we still must put it to death. We must actively put it to death. So temptations will come. And what is the promise we have every time a temptation comes? God gives us a way out every time. Has no power over you. Unless you give it power. Yes, there will be times where we have to confess our sin. And what promise do we have then? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. And this last part should have a lot of meaning for you after this. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because the gospel is more powerful than you think it is. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And then he gets to verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. And then in the next two weeks, for sin will have no dominion over you, verse 14. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. That's what grace does. Verse 18, having been set free from sin, you are now a slave of righteousness. Verse 22, but now that we have been set free, have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end, eternal life. So with that, let me end today's message by just reading the text for you one more time. What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we've been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died to sin has been set free from sin. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you help us to see the power. Help us to see the victory. Help us to see the glory. The entirety of the gospel. Help us to live in this power you are proclaiming over us even right now. Help us to live in the power of the truth you speak of us. Lord, help us to believe it. Help us to live in this freedom. Keep us from deception. Keep us from evil. And in our lives, may your will be done. And we ask this for the glory of the name of Jesus, and we ask it because of the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing.